So anyway, so I'm here to introduce you to uh, Lindsay Herbert. Lindsay is the author of Digital Transformation. The book has received international praise for its practical framework on how to drive major change through innovation at enterprise scale. She's an IBM inventor and the chief innovation officer for IBM Garage GBS, uh, where she advises the leaders of major companies on how to further their innovation agendas, as well as creating breakthrough technologies for IBM itself. And hopefully she'll tell us what IBM Garage GBS uh, is during her presentation as well. So anyway, please can you welcome Lindsay. Well, aren't we all brave? Look at us congregating with our germs, being all close to one another. Has anyone been practicing creative handshakes? You know, elbows, feet, been a few already, myself today. Um, but I think there's another reason why we're all brave in this room together, and that is the world is a terrifying place right now. I mean, we've got the, the encroaching pandemic, you know, of course, uh, we also had to contend with the fact that, what, all of Australia pretty much was on fire for half of the year. That was fun. Uh, we've got storm after storm after storm. And oh, the only reassurance, really, that it's going to continue, all this extreme weather. But even if you look on a smaller scale, even if you think about just our day-to-day our -day lives and our day-to-day -day work, we're also having to be brave all the time because there are scary things there too. Like the fact that things keep changing, technology keeps changing, society keeps changing at such a rapid pace, but we're still stuck with the constraints of our own workplaces, with the bureaucracies, with the legacy IT systems, where you, know, you might be hearing about the, the latest and greatest in technology, but actually just reliably getting and sending an email feels like a victory. And on top of all of that, you guys in particular are brave because you've devoted your careers to the thing that's actually supposed to help solve problems, education. But there are so many issues, there's so many things to be afraid of within education. And you also need to be brave because you know, you've got teachers with less and less time, you've got students with more and more pressures, you've got a changing workforce that is changing at such a rapid rate that the employers themselves aren't really sure how to contend with all that change, let alone you guys actually trying to arm the next generation of problem solvers and workers to go in and address it. So we could focus on how scary things are. We could focus on how brave we have to be. Or we can adopt an innovation mindset. Because the innovation mindset actually looks at problems as an infinitely renewable source of inspiration. Problems are the things that keep the innovator going. They're the things that give, make us want to get up in the morning. But the problem is you have to know how to be an innovator. Because there are definitely ways to do it really, really badly, but instead will result in burnout, that will result in a lot of wasted money, and worse, it will result in people thinking that innovation itself isn't trustworthy, that technology is not trustworthy, that we should just stick to doing things the way we've always done them. But in a changing world, sticking to what we've always done is about the only surefire way to go extinct. So what I want to do with my 30 minutes is I want to talk to you about this term, digital transformation. And, and I call my talk Digital Transformation, the bear in the room, because one of the biggest problems when we think about innovation, transformation technology, is we, we don't address the actual terrifying problem. Instead, we tiptoe around it. So during my talk, I'm gonna share with you how to address the terrifying problem, the way, the three golden rules, the ways for doing it. I'm gonna share with you a bunch of stories of other organizations, other leaders, that hopefully you can draw some inspiration from. But I'm also gonna make sure to leave some time at the end so you can challenge me and ask me 
about the challenges that you're facing so that when you leave here, you've actually got not just bravery, which you already have, you've got an idea of what to do next. So the bear in the room, right? Well, we know the expression, the elephant in the room. Now, the elephant in the room is unfortunately what a lot of innovation programs set out to tackle. Uh, The elephant in the room is that awkward problem that drains time, energy, and resources. It's really easy to focus on. You know, elephant in the room type problems are things like, oh, it'd be nice if this process were more digital. Or, oh, it'd be really nice if our website were more current. Or, oh, it'd be really nice if we could uh, engage with students over social media in a more effective way. Now, the thing about elephant in the room problems is you can continue to ignore them forever and your organization will still exist. It might lose money and time and effort and people might be annoyed working around it, but it's not going to ultimately fail in its purpose. Now, conversely, you get a black bear in your room and that bear is going to proceed to tear the place apart until you stop it. Now, black bear or bear in the room, I'm saying black bear, by the way, because I'm from northern Canada, and you can tackle a black bear, you cannot tackle a grizzly bear. If you want to know more about bear safety, ask me after the, the talk is done. So you got a bear in the room? That is a problem that if you don't address it, you will make yourself, your organization, obsolete. These are the problems that stand in the way of your actual mission, the reason that you exist. I don't just mean in your organizations, I also mean as professionals in your own careers. So I'm going to take you through the three ways to spot and address the bear in the room. But first, let me talk a little bit about who I am and and why. So in, in the introduction, you heard that my, my day job is, is in IBM, and there's me uh, being interviewed on BBC Click for, for one of my inventions I did for, for IBM. But the reason I'm here today is actually this, this book, Digital Transformation, because I'm someone who can't help but spot bears in the room, no matter where I work or where I go, whether I was you know, back in my homeland of Canada or when I first moved to the UK and, and actually was based in Wales, of, of all places. I can't help but spot problems and I can't help but tackle the problems that get under my skin. But what I was noticing was the more organizations I worked with trying to help them address their bears in the room, the more I was encountering the same kind of problems and failures of methodology over and over and over again. The same wrong mindsets that were being employed at all these different companies. And it didn't matter whether, whether it was a small company, whether it was a big private organization, public, didn't matter. And so I set out to expand beyond my own knowledge, my own experience base, and interview people all over the world who had led major transformations major innovations, fought battles and won, and had the scars to prove it, and consolidate all that down into this best practice that I'm going to start, I'm going to share a bit of it with you today, the whole book isn't been into this talk. But that's why it's important, right? It's not about how to do it specifically for your job or for your company. There are actually rules and best practices that apply regardless, and why? because it actually comes down to something that we fundamentally all have in common, and that's our own human nature. There's no such thing as a piece of technology that can solve a problem. Only people can solve problems. It's up to us to create the technologies, to to use the technologies, but it's us that identifies how to use them. And this is really important because this is the view we all have of the future. Right? We have absolutely no idea what the next big scary thing or the next big exciting thing is going to be on that horizon. And that's okay. Because if you adopt what real digital transformation actually means, it means 
to become adaptive to change itself. Now, the rub, or the digital part, is that because of the scale and pace of change today, you can't adapt to change without leveraging data, technology, and new ways of working. But it's through those new ways of working and the new mindset that you adopt that suddenly using data, choosing technologies, applying them, being iterative, testing things out becomes so much easier. Because it's all down to that thing that unifies us, our curiosity as humans and our desire to work together to solve big problems. Now, I want to do some myth busting before I get started. Uh, a universal rule. This scruffy millennial or, or Gen Z here, he feels just as threatened by change as the rest of us do. And if he's told that the way he needs to get his educational credentials is going to change drastically in a way that he can't predict, and, or that the job market's about to change drastically in a way that he can't predict, his blood pressure is going to skyrocket in the same way that someone in their 50s would feel if they were told the same thing. So what we can learn, though, from the younger generations is their willingness to try new things quickly, see if they work, and then reject them and move on if they don't work. Because if you think about it, millennials and Gen Zs, one of the things they've had in common is they've grown up in this rapid pace of technological change. So they think nothing of trying something out, going, that's dumb, and throwing it away. Whereas what, what the older generations do, we take a look at it and we go, well, I can't quite figure it out. It must be my fault. I, I'm not good with tech. I don't understand this app thing. It's my fault. Millennials, they don't understand something. It's because it's dumb. I don't need it. Throw it away. Right? That's the thing. This universal rule is really that success comes from spotting the early and small signs of change. Trying something out to see if it has a positive effect. And if it doesn't, not beating yourself up. Moving on to the next thing, it's a totally different mindset that younger people have an easier time adopting because they've grown up with it. But if we can adopt it in our organizations and in our own careers, then suddenly change doesn't need bravery. Instead, it instills excitement. So as I said, I'm going to teach you three of the most important rules when it comes to achieving real digital transformation. And the first one I've already hinted at, spotting the worthy problem, the real bear in the room. Elephants are everywhere. Bears, sometimes bears have been present in an organization for so long that people actually grow to love the bear. They think the bear is needed. So spotting it and tackling it with as many people as possible is critical. And it comes right back down to what is your purposeful mission? Why do you really exist and what keeps you going, both as a professional and in the context of your organization? So for example, Danish oil and natural gas, we're facing a financial crisis. The price of natural gas had plummeted, price of oil had plummeted, and essentially their future was looking very bleak. I mean, it's in the name, oil and natural gas. So what they decided to do was bring in some, some fresh thinking, some new mindset. And they actually brought in this, they got a new CEO who had led the transformation at Lego. And the new CEO said, well, you know what? Our mission is not to, to, to mine and sell oil and natural gas. Our mission is about providing the world with energy. And if you think about the expertise that we've built up with offshore oil rigs, how could that be translated into uh, a sector that's not on the decline, but is instead experiencing massive growth? The switch to wind energy for Danish oil and natural gas was so significant that they actually had to change their name. They're now Orsted. 93% of their revenue 
now comes from wind. And they continue to grow. Now, I'm not saying that you have to totally turn your whole organization on its head. Instead, sometimes it's about just rethinking how you're solving your mission by focusing on specific problems. Like, for example, Boehringer Engelheim, <coughs> pharmaceutical company. Do they exist to make pills and medicines? No. They exist to prevent and cure disease and illness. So when they looked at the opportunities that technology presented, they ended up coming up with an experiment where they used IoT sensors on pig farms. And what were they doing? Listening to the pigs. Because if you can hear the beginning of swine cough, you can save thousands in that population. If you can isolate the source and vaccinate and, and, and do everything that you need to prevent it from spreading, you can save a farmer millions, not to mention all the lives of the pigs. Well, temporarily. <laughs> It comes down to finding that problem, the worthy problem, that aligns to the mission. My favorite example of that is the Rijksmuseum. Now, the Rijksmuseum had to close for a period of refurbishments to their building, so the director took that opportunity to tour the world and look at museums and galleries for examples of inspiration of the best applications of technology. Now, What is the, the mission, the purpose of the Rijksmuseum? To preserve and share the art and history of the Netherlands with the world. And when that managing director toured around and he was looking at all these famous galleries and museums, every single time he saw technology, it depressed him. Because all it did was tell him when that museum or gallery last got some funding. Because if they had desktop computers in their galleries, oh, poor museum, you haven't had funding since the 90s. If they had nice uh, iPads or some touch screens, like, oh, good for you, you've got some wealthy donors. But why it really depressed him is because as soon as you walk into a gallery, you expect it to be greeted by the, the genuine, authentic thing, the thing that has moved people for hundreds of years and made it into a treasured object that deserves to be protected. Not a desktop computer. Not some digital facsimile. <laughs> so he decided that the digital transformation of the Rijksmuseum was firstly going to ban technology from the galleries. No digital screen will ever be featured in one of their galleries. And instead, he was going to use technology or the internet in particular, to help address their mission, sharing the art and history with the world, by making all of their collections available in high resolution, on their website, copyright free. Now, he said to me that at that moment, that was when every single board member gasped, because he was proposing giving away our intellectual property And he said, well, what are you afraid of? Are you afraid that people aren't going to come to the museum and they're not going to uh, want to see the real genuine thing because they saw a digital version or, oh, they printed out their own version of it? But he was quickly proven right because the visitation numbers it, were off the charts. And what they saw wasn't just an increase in visitation. What they also saw was an increase in the knowledge base of the people who came to the museum because suddenly they were better informed. They knew what they wanted to look at. They knew more about the art. They'd studied it at home. Some people even came because they saw the Night's Watch appear in an ad for yogurt going by on a bus, right? Copyright free. Advertisers started using it. But this is what I mean about finding a worthy problem. It's not about just applying tech for the sake of tech. It's looking at it like a tool and figuring out, like you would for any tool, what's the problem that we really care about that this tool can help us solve? So you've got your worthy problem. The 
the tendency of a lot of organizations or a lot of teams or individuals is just to go whole hog, try to fix it, try to tackle it yourselves. Wrong. This is the other big, terrible rule of real innovation, real digital transformation. Is that real transformation needs a lot of people from a lot of sources. If it's a problem that's actually worth solving, other people will be affected by you solving it. Those people need to be involved in the solution. Also, if it's a problem that's really worth solving, you can't fix it on your own. It'll be too big. It'll be too multifaceted. You'll need others, whether it's their expertise or their connections or just their ideas to come in and help you tackle it. <coughs> a really good example of this is Netflix. Now, Netflix is used a lot in these sorts of presentations like, oh, DVDs and Blockbuster, right? That's not what I'm going to talk about. Instead, Netflix's mission is, was never to be the biggest DVD distributor, right? Because if it had been, they were, you know, that's already not relevant. And its big mission was also not to be the biggest content distributor, right? Their mission is around entertaining the world. And so the biggest growth area for Netflix right now is, as we all know, if you have a Netflix subscription, is original content. Now, it'd be very easy from the outside to think that Netflix has managed this massive growth in revenue from original, 44% growth in revenue, by the way, from its original content, that they did it by just hiring all the best talent in the media, in, in film and TV, and by applying their fancy algorithm, you know, which assesses what we watch and then decide, you know, writes a script automatically. Well, that's wrong. That's not how Netflix works at all. They don't hire directors and, and they don't bring people in-house. They actually work with some of the best and some of the most diverse minds out there, but they keep them in, as independents. And yes, the algorithm, and over the many algorithms that they run, gives some insight into what we watch, but the problem with any kind of machine learning is it's all based on past behavior. So if you're trying to find the next big thing, the next new original piece of entertainment, you're not going to find it analyzing past data. So they're actually responsible for hiring directors who, in some cases, have never directed before. They hire more directors who are from, or they, I should say the commission, more directors who are from diversity backgrounds, uh, more female directors. And it's because they understand that to achieve their mission, they need insight and ideas and expertise from a lot of sources. Similarly, The Guardian. Now, The Guardian's transformation happened when they had to make the, the pivotal decision of do they put their content behind a paywall or not. Because at the time when I was interviewing them, I was writing my book, that was, that was the most common trend for, for especially the very prestigious journalism outlets, media agencies, the ones that really wanted to preserve the integrity of journalism, and that, that was the, the core part of their mission, all of their competitors in that space were putting their content behind the paywall. The Guardian decided that in order to stay relevant, in order to stay true to their mission, they weren't going to go in that direction. Instead, they were going to rely on the fact that their readers are of a different sort, that their readers also care passionately about the integrity of journalism and what's going on in the world. So instead of putting their content behind a paywall, they introduced a two-tier subscription system. You can be a subscriber, or you can be a supporter. And a supporter is someone who, for no reason, pays extra. You don't get any more journalism. You just pay slightly more, because what you're doing is you're contributing to that mission. And you're actively saying, I care about this too. And they're expanding this model now to understand, based on that supporter base, what do people actually care about that they need to pursue in greater depth? They're taking strategic direction now. 
from that supporter base. Now, I don't want to get, leave you with the impression that it's always about outside the organization. Sometimes organizations are big and sprawling or very, very siloed. And actually, just pulling people from multiple sources as a first step can mean pulling people from within those silos, getting people to work more collaboratively just within one organization. And, and I can't think of an organization that I've worked with that is more geographically dispersed, and unfortunately, as a result of that, had deeper silos than any other I've encountered, which is the United Nations Refugee Agency. They're responsible for anyone in the world who has to flee their country for safety. So if you had to flee because you were being persecuted, because of war, because of disaster, the United Nations Refugee Agency are the only agency in the world who are responsible for you as a stateless person. And at the time when I started working with them, they discovered something truly horrifying, which was that anyone in the world, regardless of how much money you have, what country you live in, if you are forced to flee in the middle of the night, wearing just the clothes on your back, there's one thing you'll be pretty much guaranteed to have with you. It's not your passport, it's not money, it's not your identity documents. It's, of course, mobile phone. At the time that I started working with the United Nations, the only device that their website would not display on was mobile phones. So you had people who were fleeing disasters, who were fleeing war, and basically being herded into camps managed by people with clipboards when all of those people were carrying in their back pockets essentially a geo-targeted supercomputer. So solving their problem, though, didn't mean immediately trying to take over every single United Nations website globally as a central team and forcing all the different agencies around the world to adopt a new mobile-friendly website. No, that was, it would completely backfire, right? You'd get all sorts of resistance. You'd get all sorts of that won't work here, not invented here syndrome. So instead, the way that they achieved their massive digital transformation was by first reaching out and looking for the pockets of excellence that existed around the world in all the different agency offices. And they found there were so many, and I feel like this is especially true in the education sector as well. So many people put hard work into researching good technologies, good ways of using things that exist, you know, creating and collaborating on something new, and the problem is that no one else knows about them. So the first step for the UN was bringing that knowledge together and highlighting where people were being digital champions. Exactly the same thing is true for education. There are pockets of brilliance lying everywhere, but no one feels like they have the time or the inclination or the, the reason to go and look for them. Now, you've got your problem to solve. You've created a ragtag group of people from lots of sources with background, disparate backgrounds and expertise levels to solve it. What's the third rule? Well, the unfortunate thing with technology is that people can sell it. And a lot of times when people can sell something, they can sell it as though it's a package solution. And even when you've got all your people together and you've got your worthy problem, suddenly in walks in a tech salesperson and says, have I got the thing for you? And, and I'm sure you guys can list a, a, a long sin list, even longer than I could, of all of the things that have backfired in terms of tech in education. I'm, the first one on the top of my head is smart boards. Right? How many people invest in a smart board and then end up not using it because they couldn't mount it in the right place or no one really knew how to use it or someone just came up and used a marker on it straight away and went, oh, ooh, ooh, ooh. that's done. <laughs> so the third rule, and it's the hardest to follow really, is that real transformation is learned and earned. 
not purchased. Now, history repeats itself. I saw a news heading recently about Cebo Express and Cineworld, the other one, you know, the cinema company. Uh, Cebo Express do airport shops, Cineworld, obviously cinemas, um, that they were going to be using Amazon's new frictionless payment solution, their Amazon Go solution. They were going to buy that and put it and implement it in their stores. And I just thought, when's the last time I remember reading about a major brand deciding to buy stuff from Amazon and outsource to Amazon? Oh, right. Those guys. Now, there's a big problem with deciding that something is important enough that it's worth spending a lot of money on but not on getting your people skilled up in it, getting your people working with it all the time. And this, however, is what we do all the time. We outsource our tech platforms. We outsource, we outsource. When there's so, there is absolutely a better way. Now we can start big. Like for example, Ecolab. They basically made their money from uh, industrial cleaning solutions. But when the CEO recognized that their growth was starting to you know, slow down, he decided to go on a mission and speak to customers all over the world. And he was surprised to find out that all of the customers shared the same worthy problem, which was that their growth, because it's a B2B organization, their growth was going to be impacted by water-strained regions. Places like India, like Mexico, like California, Places that are already facing a shortage of, of reliable, clean water, and especially in industrial supplies. Now, Ecolab CEO at that point could have decided, okay, I'll just buy a company that, that does you know, things with water cleaning systems, and great, we'll, we'll have that as a separate part of the business, and I can see my numbers start to tick back up again. But he decided, no, you know what? If I look back to the founding mission, that reason for our existence, do we exist to sell industrial cleaning chemicals? No, we exist to provide a cleaner world. So he did do that massive merger with a company that does specialize in water purification, filtration, cleaning systems, but he made the concerted effort to actually merge the company completely. Everyone's mission is around furthering this agenda. And the people who didn't have expertise in it were being partnered and paired with the people who did so that they could come up with new projects, find new worthy problems to try to solve for their clients or customers together. Already, the revenue from the clean water parts of the business is over 44% and growing. Now... Going back to education, though, sometimes the barriers feel so frustrating that it would just be easier to buy our way out of them. My favorite story in this respect is Harvard University. Their chief digital officer, she had just come into her position. The iPhone had just been invented and hit the market, and people all go nuts about it. And she decides, you know what, we're Harvard. I am the first chief digital officer of Harvard. I want an app. And I want this to kickstart a whole set of strategies around mobile and digital engagement for current students, for prospective students. You know, the plans were big. There were worthy problems backing them. So she created a job ad for an app developer, iPhone app developer, gave it to HR, and sat back and waited for all the interview candidates. Who never came. She goes back to HR. What's going on? Yeah, we're really sorry. No one's applied. No, no one's applied. We're, we're Harvard. We could post an ad for cleaning services and we get thousands of people applying. What, how, what? She takes a look at the ad. It's the same ad that she wrote and provided to HR, but with one addition, one line. Minimum five years experience. <laughs> <laughs> and she uh, and the HR said, we're not idiots, we know it's brand new, but 
So the seniority you want to give this role, for the amount of money you want to pay this person, <coughs> university policy dictates five years experience minimum. Maybe someone will apply anyway. <sighs> now at that point, the chief digital officer, Perry, she had a decision to make. It would have been so delectably easy to just walk out of that HR office, go back into her digital safe environment, and go, we are hiring freelancers. <laughs> but she knew that if she did that, that same mindset, that same problem, that same policy base was going to continue to undermine every single thing that she wanted to do to solve her worthy problems. So she took her exciting plans for an app and put them to the side, rolled up her sleeves, and started calling meetings with all the senior leadership for Harvard to change the hiring policy. Now, this is unfortunately sometimes the thing you have to do. If you're dealing in an organization where that bear has been tearing the place apart slowly for so long that people have gotten to love the bear, they're used to the bear, they think the bear is key to their success, you might have to start your digital transformation journey with a lot of tedious meetings. You don't do the cool tech thing first. You've got to get people understanding that the bear is the enemy and that we're all here to actually solve the same problem. We're all here with the same critical mission. And sometimes the desire to go outside and to reach out and find all those pockets of, of brilliance in places that don't exist in your sector or in your organization is so great that you don't realize how badly set up your organization is for, for working with them. HSBC, they wanted to work with fintechs, you know, financial tech startups. And so they started just kind of hoovering them in, you know, anyone that had a cool fintech startup thing, you know, yeah, come and work with HSBC, come and work with us. And what they found were kind of the, the decaying corpses of fintechs lying at their feet going, how, what, how did we do this? They're all dead. And they realized that their giant procurement processes their cumbersome legal agreements. The way that a big corporation is meant to work with other companies is they're meant to work with other big corporations. So they have giant legal teams that can get together for weeks. A startup is usually like two, three people. You tie them up reading paperwork and documentation and they're not building their business. They're no longer working on their solutions. And HSBC were essentially strangling them to death. So they realized that the startup world wasn't going to change. And if they really wanted to learn from these startups, if they really wanted to grow their own digital skill sets within HSBC, they had to figure out a way to keep these guys alive in order for that to happen. So they created new parts of their business, new parts of legal, new parts of procurement so that they had slimmed down versions of processes, so that they would even provide free legal advice to some of the startups that they were wanting to work with. You know, here's a boilerplate contract that you guys can use until you, you've got, you got on your feet and you've hired your own lawyers. You know, you can feel free to use this one, that sort of thing. Because this idea of we're all in it together, that the change we're all facing is just going to keep happening. It's, it's so fundamental, just in the same way that we as humans fundamentally are curious and want to work with others to solve that curiosity. So those are three of what is actually five different stages in, in my book about digital transformation. But I wanted to highlight those three because they are the most critical and they are the ones that people tend to get wrong, especially when there's some shiny new piece of technology or worse, some shiny face tech salesman knocking at your door wanting to sell you something. And those again are 
real transformation starts with the problem we're solving. Where's the bear? Real transformation needs lots of people from lots of sources. A team on its own will never chase a bear out of any room. And real transformation is learned and earned, not purchased. And that also means stop using the word fail, or even fail fast, if anyone's ever heard that term. Fail fast and break things. It's just not true. Learn fast. Because once you become focused on your mission, on your, on your worthy problem, suddenly finding something that didn't quite work out and solving it doesn't feel like a failure. It feels like, oh, phew, glad we didn't pursue that. Let's stay laser focused on that worthy problem. Because yes, this is the view of the future we all share, but that's just it. We all share the same view. So if real digital transformation is to become adaptive to change itself, and the only way to adapt to major change is by leveraging data, new technology, and new ways of working, then we are all on the same boat. And we should embrace that. We're all afraid of change, but we're all innately curious as human beings. And success really does come from adapting to those small and early signs of change. So I'm just going to leave you with one thought. It's very easy to focus on how little time you have in the day, how many meetings you have, how many emails you have to respond to. You know, if you're if you're actually an educator directly yourself and you've got students, then your time, the extent to which you feel time poor is crippling, with so many of you even choosing to leave the teaching profession. But I ask you, that time poorness, how much of that time poorness is actually coming from wasting your time with an elephant, from wasting your time on projects that are just going to move the elephants around making everyone feel a little bit more comfortable in the room. Whereas if you really rolled up your sleeves and started talking about the bear, how many other people, like-minded people, do you think you could find who are just as fed up as you? Probably just looking around in this room, you could probably start to find quite a few of them. Thank you very much. I wish you luck in all your bear hunting. Um, can we get the, uh, the lights up so we can see questions? You can uh, uh, write, isn't it? <laughs> um, I've got a few questions on our, on our app as well. But have you, have you come across, what bears have you come across in universities and colleges? Uh, so I think the biggest one is this obsession with uh, externally facing websites, uh, obsession with um, redoing a particular learning tool that was maybe done a while ago and wants to be redone. And the problem is that people start to get very turf defensive and they stop focusing on the bigger picture. Maybe the bigger picture has never even been identified and agreed upon. And instead it becomes uh, a, a head-to-head battle over who gets the most real estate on a homepage. You know, something as stupid as that. Yeah. No, I've got a few questions on here while we're waiting for hands. The number one question, excuse my audience, but is they want to know who you worked for in White. Oh, so uh, before I was at IBM, I was at a small digital agency called Precedent. And through Precedent, I actually worked with quite a few universities, University of Swansea, Cardiff, uh, quite a few, even um, down in Australia, uh, Monash University, biggest university in Australia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's your answer. Precedent. So uh, have we got any questions from the audience? I'm not seeing any at the moment. So another question here. Um, got it up there. So many of the examples have been companies that wanted to transform for growth. Nope. <laughs> or financial reasons. Oh, were there, were there questions disappeared? Uh, it's there, that question. There. Oh. oh, I see. Okay. Oh, got yeah, cut so off. It will appear on the monitor in a minute. Okay. Uh, what are your strategies for sparking transformation in a company where... Finance and stats on paper suggest they're already great. Um, yeah, that's 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 really tricky, and I think 
going back to the, the fundamental mission of the company is what's really needed. And for education in particular, I think it's easy for people to think they know their mission in education because your mission is to be the world's leading this in research, the world leading this in training people, the world leading... But the problem is that that's not really why you exist. You exist to prepare people for a changing world. So just because your recruitment and your admission rates <coughs> excuse me, are, are up... <laughs> <laughs> mask? Does anyone have a mask? Um, just because your, your recruitment and your admission rates are up does not mean that you are fulfilling that mission. So looking at different stats might be the, the real trigger at that point. How satisfied are your graduates? How, you know, are they staying in the paths, the career paths that you prepared them for? Or are they bouncing around all over the place? How connected are your alumni networks? How engaged are they? Because those are the early signs of future financial trouble. So if you can spot those early signs and start to do experiments on how to affect that, push the needle in the right way, um, then you're actually preventing a future financial crisis. Oh, I've got one up there, but while, while, while the mic's coming to there, a great question here, and I'll, I'll interpret the question, is what happens if you haven't got the seniority to tackle the bear? Yeah. If you haven't got that seniority to get people in the room and call, and call the meetings? You prob- and, and that's the thing, most people don't have the seniority, and that's where numbers become really important. I don't mean numbers as in stats, I mean numbers of people. And that's what I meant at the end of the talk where I said... How many like-minded people do you think you could find? Because it's easy for senior leadership to ignore one person. And if anything, one person just feels like a complainer. It's harder for senior leadership to ignore an entire faculty or an entire portion of the student body or an entire, you know, or all the science teachers in the country. You know, that becomes a lot harder to ignore. And so you might not have the seniority to go straight up the ladder, but you definitely have the influence to go across and especially working with the people who have the same worthy problem as you, who are fighting that same bear, but maybe in a totally different part of the country or a different part of, you know, from a different point of view, absolutely, you can find other people to fight that fight with you. Thank you. Question up in there. Thank you. Uh, I had a question around, you talk about mission and how important that is for a company to um, embrace change. There's a big movement around open access, and a lot of publishers, especially university press publishers, are shitting themselves, despite the fact that this is directly related to their mission. So how do you overcome the cultural or perhaps like, path-dependent culture that's come out of making money out of for the way other systems that are so embedded? Mm. Well, um, is that just through radical culture change, or is it a bit more subtle? Well, and sometimes it's about looking at the numbers, right? Because... Uh, the Guardian example that I shared, very similar, right? And part of it for them was also a maths exercise. They looked at how much money they thought they'd be able to make by putting their content behind the paywall, how many people it would alienate, especially young people who are the future readers and supporters. And so it was actually by looking at the numbers and running some different models that they realized that actually the passion they instill in the subject matter is greater than just the disposable income levels of the small percentage of people they thought would be willing to to pay to get behind that paywall. So I think it's a similar sort of exercise. It's going to be part culture change and mindset change, but also, you know, it's like like that last question. The numbers, the finances might be okay now, but how satisfied are people really? And how many challengers are there that are disrupting that market that are already showing signs of people becoming even less satisfied in the future than they are today, you look at that, you run those numbers through that model, and before you know it, you're realizing that you're, you're on a sinking ship if you continue to charge people for the pleasure of just consuming content. There's a lot of content out there. Yeah. Okay. Any other, another question? So if we get the mic up there. so Up in the back. Another question from here is suggestions for practical ways to initiate an innovation mindset Mm. in an organization. So I think it really does start with the human element. The last thing I would ever recommend anyone do is look at cool technologies or do a hackathon without first identifying what the hackathon is going to focus 
its efforts around. Um, so when it comes to real problems, you know, I've, I've touched on some of them already for the education sector, but they are things like, are people getting jobs and are they happy in those jobs? And do they continue to engage in lifelong learning once they get into those jobs? Right? If they're not coming back for more professional development, or if they're bouncing around all over the place in different professions, you, you, there is a, there's a problem right there you can identify. You know, same thing with the satisfaction of teachers. Do teachers feel like they're being effective and can grow and can be creative, or do they feel like they're just regurgitating the same stuff? You know, like could they be doing a lecture, uh, the, the exact same lecture, a hundred years ago and still have it land? There's a problem. So I think those are some of the ways to spark the mindset. It's actually about identifying the problems, figuring out which tool you need to do the job, the tech, that comes so far later. You know, it'd be like trying to plan a DIY project for your house. You don't walk in and go, I'd really like to use a hammer today. You know, you walk in and go, these countertops are terrible. My cupboard doors keep falling off. You know, every time I come home with groceries, I'm getting frustrated and we're starting to have fights with each other. It's starting to impact our relationship. I think it's time to address the cupboards. Maybe we might need a hammer. You feel it might have. <laughs> and the last question, the question from lady up there. Um, Lina uh, from West Glidor University, and thank you very much. It's worth coming to the conference for this talk, so thank you. Mm -hmm. um, but what I wanted to ask as well is how do we change fundamentally the mindset of the people making decisions because they constantly ask for quantitative approach for qualitative problems? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think sometimes as well we take so much comfort in... The, 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 the quant data that we've been looking at. Um, there was a, a, a company that I was having a meeting with the other day, and um, their problem, their, the, one of the teams within this company, their problem was that the, their website and their, hadn't been built correctly, and what that meant was that anytime someone viewed the mobile version of their website, it counted as a unique view compared to if they viewed it on their desktop. So one person could look at it on their mobile and then look at it on their desktop, and it would count as two different people having viewed the site. And what that resulted in were visitation stats that made it look like the entire population of the United Kingdom <laughs> were visiting this website. Now, they had told the senior leadership team over and over and over again the problem, the tech problem that was causing this, and the senior leadership team did not want those numbers to drop. They, even though they were fake, they were so afraid that how in their, in their tenure, visitation to the site would go from here down to here. And that's all that anyone would remember. So the, the way to convince them and the way to, to, to let go of their precious grip on those stats was to get them to fall in love with other numbers. Numbers like, how, you know, in the case of a website, how long someone's actually spending on the site and are they going through and filling in a form and engaging with a salesperson and actually completing the entire journey in a way that's trackable and provable, those were the kind of metrics they'd never had access to before because, again, the site had been built badly, and so that had to be created. So it wasn't about, okay, I'm not going to take away your precious overinflated number, but can we have permission to do some development work so that we can give you this new precious number. And over time, they stopped caring about that overinflated number quite so much because they started to recognize they could actually measure business growth based on that other number. So it's, it's not an easy and a quick battle, but give them a new my precious number to focus on. Thank you very much, Lindsay. I think there were some great questions there that we'll capture and see if we can 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 